This episode of the podcast is supported by Audible. You can download and listen to the world's best storytelling. I use it all the time to and from work. You can listen to audiobooks, original series and more on their free app. To get your free 30-day subscription, which includes a free book, click on the link in our show notes and enjoy. Hey folks, welcome to the podcast. Today I had an awesome conversation with Robert Newry, who is co-founder of Arctic Shores. Arctic Shores is a super cool tech firm that use gamification to help us hire better people, more efficiently, more effectively, all of that cool stuff. It's great. I mean, we use a lot of uh, psychometrics in our interview processes, and uh, I think this is a really cool way to do it. So we go into that, how it works, and we delve into HR, HR tech, and hope you enjoy the podcast. Hey, it's Lewis. Welcome to the podcast. Enjoy our conversations anytime, anywhere. Cool, I'm alive. Robert, thank you very much for coming in, for braving the coronavirus. <laughs> oh, pleasure, Lou. We've, we've got to stay calm in these, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In these times. So you, were, so you were just on the corona, you were saying that so your office, people can work from home or not. Yes, yeah. we had to make the call. It's hard as a CEO when you have to balance the needs of the business and the well-being of your staff. And we thought very carefully, had a long discussion with the senior management team about what was the best way to approach this. And and actually, as a software company, we're set up to work from home. We have a good work from home policy. So it, it's just become an extended work from home policy. But we just didn't want staff worrying uh, about whether it was the right thing for them to come in or whether they felt obliged to because the company hadn't made it clear. Yeah, yeah. And so the sensible thing was just to say, look, work from home. If you need to come in, come in, but but assume that you don't need to. That's awesome. So when you set the company up, it was always, so I guess all your systems are probably web-based. Yes. And people can just pick up their laptops and or log in from anywhere. Yes. I mean, it was the interesting thing of setting up a company. So I have a co-founder, Safe, uh, who's wonderful and based up in Manchester, which is where our head office is. And I'm, home for me is London. And so I said, right, okay, well, we'll set up the R&D and the head office in Manchester, and then London will be the sort of sales and delivery arm. But it meant having two offices right from the beginning. Okay. That I, just the setup and the thinking behind the company was, well, we'll be working in separate locations, traveling a lot in between, so let's just make remote working super easy. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Has that been hard? Was that hard to, to manage initially? It was and continues to be, actually, particularly as the company grows, thinking about... We were starting to get a little bit of a separate culture, a Manchester culture oh, right, and sure. a London, and we didn't want that to be the case. We wanted one Arctic Shores yeah. culture. So you have to work much harder on the communication. I mean, I, I miss the fact that I, I can't just lean over a desk and say to say, yeah. um, what do you think about this issue? Or I'm a little bit concerned about this, or I'm thinking about this pitch. You know, what's your, your take on it? And I, I actually actively have to find time and, and look in his diary as to when that's possible. You, you miss yeah. out on the ad hoc piece. Yeah. But actually, if you work at it with, you know, the communication channels that we have now with Slack, and Slack's just been brilliant uh, for us. That's been a big success story. Um, and, and just yeah. using, you know, lots of um, video. So we always insist that if we're having internal meetings, you switch the video on so we can actually see people. What video do you use? Um, well, <laughs> Zoom and then occasionally uh, Hangouts. Um, oh, yeah, I'm using Hangouts. Yeah, yeah. I like Hangouts. Yeah, yeah, no, it works really well, yeah. actually. How do you do the, fa- the like, actual FaceTime, not FaceTime, Apple FaceTime, but going to see your your team? Do you have to actively... Yes. Like, so, say, so the two of us have to think that, you know, every two weeks, um, it's safe we'll try and come down to London, and I'll go up to Manchester, yeah. just to make sure and uh, that we're seeing people, but also... Um, we're growing quite fast, and so there's just new members of staff joining. And I just didn't want it to be a long time yeah. before they got to meet the um, one of the founders of the yeah, business. Yeah, no, definitely. How did it all come about? It came about because um, Safe and I got together actually in a cafe Nero. Right. Um, after I left London my... or Manchester? Oh, see, yes, in London. <laughs> no, in London right. uh, and uh, I'd just done a, a leaving due from my previous company and had sold it, and it was time to sort of think about what next to do. And Safe came along to it, and, um, and I said to Safe, look, I'd, I'd really like to, to work with you. And... Um, He'd been the CTO of the previous business. You, you know, would you like to? We'd work together. 
You'd work together in it? We'd work together. And uh, he said, uh, yes, I would, if you've got any ideas. And I said, well, I really like this sort of concept of gamification, bringing in um, the world of, of you know, sort of engagement, and a little bit of data analytics, and uh, making things fun rather than just serious within the workplace. You know, that would, that would improve uh, engagement and take up. You know, maybe we could sort of explore that area. And he said, "Brilliant! I, you know, interested gamer, and you know, he, he's he's very much on the techie side. Yeah. So that's that was sort of exploring that space, right. and and in when we were, you know, to use the metaphorical term, playing around in the sandpit of, yeah. of ideas around gamification. Um, a friend rang up and said that his daughter had just been had applied for all the leading uh, graduate recruiters in the in the sort of marketing FMCG space uh, in the UK." And despite having phenomenal educational uh, qualifications, was being rejected at the uh, aptitude test stage, which is the first bit after the application, for every single one. And she just didn't like the format of them and underperformed every time that test. It's just online. Just an online, it's numerical reasoning, uh, some of it was logical reasoning, and and, and she just didn't like the format of it. And, And once you... You know, you see something you don't like, and makes you feel fearful. Yeah. Um, the psychology around that is presented again, and I'm going to feel uncomfortable and fearful yeah. again. Yeah. And and it turned out that all graduate recruiters were taking the same approach. So uh, interesting. So there were so that it was it was both inter uh, graduate recruiters internally at companies, and also recruitment agencies. Or? Not so much recruitment agencies. Actually, right. it was the internal, so you like, know, the like volume Barclays recruitment, and HSBC absolutely, or whatever it might be. Absolutely, all yeah. those big organisations, thousands of applicants, yeah. and the only way that they could find of of you know narrowing down who they would bring forward to an assessment centre was either what they called at the time, which I really loathe the term killer, killer questions, but okay. three, qu- they should be qualifying questions, yes. but they called yeah. them killer questions. <laughs> and, um, and then getting them to do some you know, numerical or logical reasoning test, which suited some people, particularly if you practiced, and actually put other people off. Yeah. So also, the, I mean, the academics aren't particularly a good guide of how successful you're going to be in work either. They aren't. And, you know, that's the challenge for recruiters uh, on this, or volume recruiters yeah. on this, is uh, we look at just at a degree level. Um, and then, then you've got challenges. Well, is a 2-1 from Huddersfield equivalent to a 2-1 from Exeter to a 2-1 from Liverpool? How, how do you make any kind of judgment uh, on that? Yeah. And then, and then, if you move back to A levels, so you've got an advantage over the private school system versus the state school system. Yeah. And so there are there are challenges to it. Yeah, and also you just have people, frankly, that, that develop over time. Yes, you know, you might not might not work hard, hard at school. Yes, or maybe you've been, you know, in a, in an environment where your friends don't work cards, and you get sucked into that that kind of scenario. But the, but then you start to flourish later on. Yes, it's a very. Um, and I appreciate you have thousands of applicants for these big companies. Yes, but it's it's not a it's not a very good selection process. You know, three they've got to have three A's. They've got to ace the uh, the psychometrics. Yes, it's tough. It is tough. And and where where is the identification of potential in that? So the the bit that you highlight there yeah. is for the late developer or even somebody who's got potential that just hasn't had the opportunity to have that realized or demonstrated in in any way and many many cases uh, of that and so that's why we felt that, that there must be a better way of identifying whether somebody has the capability and potential to be successful in an organization that rose above and in addition to just their cognitive ability which may or may not have been displayed up until that point through the education system yeah. education system and so how did you get from that to developing it and creating a business so the well the idea was right how could we if 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 we like the format of gamification get people yeah. engaged in it and we like this concept of if somebody's engaged then you get an authentic yeah. response and just just to clear that. gamification is you're playing a game you are using so good good point on that listeners so there are two elements the definition of gamification is the use of uh, game like techniques in a workplace environment. Now, the game-like techniques could be uh, a game, 
uh, which by definition then has points, it has levels, right. uh, it requires a degree of practice and skill um, acquisition that then means you can progress on that. But, but it doesn't have to be just that, it could just be I want to make it engaging, I want to use game like graphics to make it uh, less boring and, okay. uh, and, and more, more attractive. Uh, and we've learned actually, so we started very much purely down the gamification route, introducing points. Okay, and, the proper gaming. Yeah. And having, the challenge was always you couldn't just make it purely, well, you couldn't make it gaming because the, the, the people were applying for a, ser- you know, a serious thing, a job, a really important to them. So, so we found very quickly it was demeaning oh, interesting. To, to bring in um, an entertainment aspect to it. So what they to, thought it wasn't serious enough that's right. For the scenario that, the scenario that they they were in. Right. I mean, there was definitely an age difference there. So school leavers, graduates, you know, were were generally happier than anybody older than that. Um, but there was there was that that strong difference, um, and also the points just didn't make any sense. And we had to be very careful in getting that balance right between making it engaging. Uh, and and avoiding any of the uh, the game like um, activities that that brought in skill or reaction time because then you're measuring somebody's uh, response time uh, rather than you know their decision making which is ultimately what we're interested in is their decision making approach yeah. rather than um, are they any good at you know reacting or and they also you can build up a skill so we didn't yeah. want serious gamers to, to have an advantage <laughs> yeah. over somebody who'd never. Uh, or wasn't interested in in normal video games. Yeah, interesting. Mm. So, so you arrived at. So, so, was that the first iteration? So, the first iteration was uh, um, we <laughs> we used something like a sort of avatar uh, version. It was you had to go and uh, you were in a sort of avatar forest and you had to go and catch fireflies. So we had to keep okay. it very uh, simple and generic. The graphics, I, I, I think, were amazing. were amazing and looked looked wonderful. Um, but it, we and we had a story behind it, and you could collect points. But it became quite clear as we we talked to more and more people in the market that they wanted, if we kept that level of graphics and the points, they would use it for marketing purposes rather than selection. Really. And if we we wanted to use it for selection, why why why, why is that? They. They thought that it would, because the graphics were so strong, that it would be, in their minds then, it became an attraction tool rather than a serious selection tool. And even though we had serious science behind it and the very, very deep neuroscience and psychometric science behind the tasks that we created, the, the packaging of it were, were, were encouraging people or um, having people think about it in a way that was not the way that we wanted it to be used, which is actually in the recruitment process rather than an attraction piece. Yeah, come yeah. to us. You know, we, we're using um, gamification in our process, and come to our sites, and then the serious stuff will start. And right. Going, no, no, we Obviously. are the serious stuff. I think the opposite. I think how cool. I mean, because also it says something about someone's mindset as a candidate. You know, wow, this is really cool, and 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 they dive themselves into it rather than. I mean, if you're if you're if you're hiring a senior leader and they say, "Well, actually, this is a little bit graduate recruitment style," yes, and they're not open to it. Again, that's just something about their mindset, their approach, and their outlook. So, Lewis, you're right around, and that is an interesting piece around this. And we're starting to see some organisations now um, use our platform within a development scenario where they're going through a digital transformation. We've got a couple of clients, particularly in Germany, for example, which. Um, the manufacturing base there had been slow to adapt to this rapid change in digitalization and you can just see with the you know recent rise uh, subsequent decline but see recent rise of tesla's stock oh, yeah. price yes. you know, suddenly tesla was more valuable than volks the volkswagen group which crazy. Be, which is crazy and so you see now companies going well how do we digitize how do we get that mindset right out? and 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 you're right we found in a lot of cases that the HR team would would love what we were doing because they talk to candidates all the time. They think, wow, this is really innovative and this presents a more innovative brand image. And then it would go to the senior leadership team who'd go, games? We can't introduce games into the, the workplace or into the recruitment. Um, you know, that's, they were in their mind, they were thinking of, 
you know, World of Warcraft, uh, Grand right. Theft Auto, or yeah. you know, they just weren't they weren't thinking of Angry Birds or Candy Crush or things that people were doing all the time. I mean, just in the tube ride uh, here, I mean, I just saw at least half of people on their phone doing some sort of activity, which is a game-like activity, which is a puzzle or a yeah. card game. Some were watching uh, videos, but that's that's what people do a lot of now and just the senior leadership team just didn't have their, their minds open to it but some do because I mean you know always say this but uh, uh, recruitment's like speed dating hmm. you know you, like, you meet someone for an hour and you're deciding whether to spend most of your life with them yes it took me five years to propose to my wife at least <laughs> whereas I have to make yes. a quick decision yes. and I see these people more often yes so I think ultimately the more information about someone the better yes and, and, and I think these games are great because you're getting stuff that you wouldn't normally get from a, let's say, a standard interview in inverted yes. commas, where most people are just saying, tell me about your background, why did you leave this job, what are your motivations, you, you know, like really classic questions that you can just prepare for. There's a, there's a quote which um, sits on the internet that's been attributed to Plato. I've, I've not been able to uh, track this down, but right. the quote goes, uh, you can learn more about somebody in an hour of play than you can in a year of conversation. Love that, yeah. and and I love the concept of that, which is yeah. um, I want to for me to really understand in this sort of speed dating approach. I want to do something with you and see how we might work together, see how you might approach things, and if that's in line with you know the needs of that job and the culture of that that organisation, I could spend days and hours in conversation with you. And you provide your own filter then in terms of the risk, particularly in a recruitment scenario, a high stakes scenario. Yeah. I will yeah. tell you what you want to hear from me in order to get the job. Whereas if you're being asked to do a task in the way that the Arctic Shores assessment works, we're picking up lots of subconscious decision making shifts. That means that we do learn something about you at that intrinsic uh, level that you couldn't detect. Yeah. Uh, from from just a, a conversational approach. That I completely agree. But, I mean, actually, work experience and um, scenarios like that is a much mm. better predictor of whether someone's going to be to perform well in a job or not. Yes. The other thing is, when I go to the gym or I play football, yes, you find out an awful lot about someone. You've got no idea what they do for work. Yeah. Like no idea. Yeah. But I could probably describe that person so well. Yes. You know, they're like, um, uh, what they're like, how resilient they are, you know, all of those types of things. It's really interesting. It is. And I, and I think that's a great example of, of how observing somebody when they're doing things, and particularly if you put them under pressure a bit too. Yeah. So that's the uh, the other element around this is, is you know, how do you, you crank up the pressure a bit to see, do does that performance still maintain there? Or actually, do we see a decline in performance? Do we see um, a reaction to that saying, actually, this is too fast for me or too complex? Yeah. And... And that that is something that you know, if you if you actually think of a of, a, of, of gamification and a game based assessment as more of a behaviour based assessment because that's yeah. ultimately the, the game element here is to try and get you engaged yes. so you're not thinking about you're being assessed and then the rest is monitoring your behaviours yeah. then that is the scenario that you're seeing in a sports scenario yeah. exactly that you're engaged in it you're thinking about scoring the goal or whatever it might be yeah. and then everybody else is observing the way that you go about that yeah. and then you learn it's about like that. the interesting thing is observing how someone behaves when they're down 1-0 yeah. or yes. their, their teammate has like made a mistake and you see some people just absolutely berating their teammate yes others are like come on guys you know let's crack on let's yes. get this goal back you know yes. they fight to the last minute and stuff i think it's, it's really interesting it is and you know that's that's where i think companies are now realizing we need to take a different approach to the recruitment and there's lots of things about you know the, the the CV or to use the American term the resume is dead it's you've got to be careful about statements like that because actually the work experience is is still really important as a reference point it's it's more a case of well how do we actually go above the information that somebody's just presenting to us yeah or go underneath the information that somebody's presenting to us and get that that deeper understanding that will then guide a an interview um, in a way that really starts to explore based on information that you've got about that person yeah. rather than just okay well, I'm, I have to interview based on what I see and what I hear. Yeah, no, definitely. But I mean, the, the resume or CV, it means definitely useful. It's ultimately a tool for someone to get an interview. Yes, because I mean, there are certain technical skills that someone looks for for a job, but then. 
the recruitment industry definitely needs to be more multifaceted with yeah. psychometrics, people interviewing in better ways. Um, it can be improved a lot. People are doing it, but there's still an awful lot of companies. They just they get the CV and they have a chat about the profile. They, they get this feeling. I really like that person. It's still the main feedback I get from clients or candidates. Because I always say, you know, how do you, how did the interview go, or how do you feel it went, something like that. And it's always the first thing is about people. I really felt like I got on well with that person from both sides. And once you have that good feeling, everything else almost gets like it's just to validate the decision that yes. they've already made. When when is it useful to use psychometrics then? Because if you're using it at the end. You're just validating the decision. Or you're like, mm, don't worry about the psychometrics, it's fine. You know, we know this person is the right person for the job. Do you use it at the beginning? I mean, when's like the optimal uh, point? It's a great question. And, um, and and as somebody, I suppose, who comes from, from looking at the data that we collect from our assessment, the moment you start thinking about recruitment as being a data-led decision-making process with a human wrapper around it, then the question is more about how early on in the process should I get the data that I then use multiple times to help me get a, a better understanding of this person. So a lot of people ask me of where should I put psychometrics and the obvious answer for, for me is right at the beginning but don't then, which a lot of companies make the mistake of, is well, I'll use it at the beginning and then I'll have the interview and I'll do the interview in the same way. No, you've got this data, leverage it. So if you've learned something about somebody at the beginning of the process, then use the data again for the interview and make the interview. So um, I think using it early, helping then think about how you're gonna use that data to frame the interview. And then and then use the, the chemistry piece, which is important because ultimately yes. it's a cultural fit, yeah. to, to help make the decision between candidates that you think both of whom you could employ, yeah. and then ultimately it'll be a bit more down to, well, do I think that person understands me and therefore the team yeah. around me? And so, so, so the output from your psychometrics, do you then give advice to people on what questions that they can ask or areas to probe? Yeah, so it's one of the things that um, we're, we're, we're bringing out now as an interview guide oh, to it. And, and one of the, the problems around, I think, psychometrics uh, is uh, the people who've used them in the past is that they're not quite sure as to, to whether um, this is a, a sort of astrology type of approach and sort of star signs that right. you're giving me because I don't know how to read this now. Yeah, they're quite hard to read off them. Exactly, yeah. and, and everything potentially looks good at that point. And, yeah. um, and so you, you have this problem that particularly within the recruitment sector uh, or the recruitment industry, which is, well, I, you know, I, this is my value as a recruiter, um, is that I understand somebody, I bring some extra insight that psychometrics can't do. And they see psychometrics as a threat rather than actually you could do your job better and get more value. And I, we've seen some really good examples of that with the two or three, and it's usually more sort of boutique recruitment agencies that have used our uh, psychometric assessment and thought about how they can leverage their own knowledge and expertise on top of the data about that candidate that, that we've given them. Yeah, that's really interesting. It's, so, it's important to do. We've been using it more and more. And you're finding now, because we, we incorporate it as part of our search process, mm. um, and more and more people now are taking it up. But how they use it is really interesting. Yes. And, and, and you can see sometimes if they value it or how, how much they value it, or whether their own gut feeling trumps anything yes. else that, that might come on down. Yes, and, I, and I, I think one of the things that perhaps the psychometric, in, psychometric industry hasn't necessarily helped itself with is that training. Uh, one hand is language. So sometimes yeah. you see the language of a psychometric system is, I'm not really sure I understand this. And, or if, if I do understand it, is that because it's based on my prior knowledge or assumptions around that that is relevant or not relevant? And then secondly, the, it's been a little bit of a money-making uh, side for the, for the psychometric industry of, well, I'll charge you several thousand pounds to get qualified for this. Oh, yeah, they and love that. Go, well, hang on, do, do, do I need several thousand pounds? Or as you, would it yeah. just be helpful if you used simple language and gave me a 
simple, you know, easy to read guide of how to interpret it rather yeah. than charging me lots of money. Yeah, I got sold into that. I won't mention which company, yes. but they all do that. Yeah. It's crazy. And I think that, that, has, that, that has to be changed. And if we're really going to democratise you know, the use of psychometrics, which has benefits not just for you, the recruiter, but for the individual too. Absolutely. You know, yeah. Just learning more. I mean, I, I wish I'd done a psychometric assessment and had some feedback from that early on in my career. So I would know what type of thing that I would be best suited yeah, to. Yeah. The other big thing is how accurate are they? <laughs> well, <laughs> they yes. Because time, like... Yeah, there's a margin and error, of course, in yeah. any 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 um, scientific tool. the The interesting thing I think about psychometrics is that we're measuring something, you know, personality, uh, which is part of the human brain, and neuroscience is making great strides on that. But uh, we we still don't understand everything about how the brain works and what's driving uh, the the decisions that we make. And personality, at the end of the day, is the expression of the chemical and electrical activity that's going on in your brain and there's so much diversity uh with within the the human species <clears throat> yeah. that, that try and find a, a, a measurement tool um that is precise and accurate for everyone on there um is is going to be you know something that we haven't achieved yet but what we what we do have around that is something that's a much better measurement of it. So it's not perfect. No. It, it, you know, we'll be, be some way off before it ever gets to to you know a really high degree of, of accuracy on this. But it is accurate enough to to be better um, and significantly better than asking somebody to make a decision based on what they see or hear. Interesting. Um, most people feel like that no one can be better than their gut. Yeah. The other really interesting thing, I've, I've, I don't know, there's a great book by Yoel Harari. Yes. He's written a couple, but the, the, um, the interesting one is uh, Homo Deus, Human Gods, and he's yes. putting forward, you probably read it, but, you know, no one can know me better than I know myself. But it feels like, actually, maybe these these technologies will ultimately know me better than I know myself. They will. And that is what I think is really interesting, too, because... I often get asked, you know, one of the things that we measure in our assessment is resilience. So if I ask you, Lewis, how resilient are you? You're going to do two things around this. One, you're going to say, oh, well, why is Robert asking me this? And if it's I'm applying for a job, of course I'm going to say I'm going to resilient. I'm going to tell him how many marathons I've run and I can give it. And I don't know whether um, that is true or not, first of all. But secondly, uh, you may say, well, I'm the most resilient of my not very resilient friends. <laughs> right. And so in your, your mind, you are super resilient because your, your comparison group is, is self-selected. Yeah. And, and you may have chosen them because you are more resilient than this rather lazy group of friends. Uh, I don't yeah. wish to, to in any way challenge your friends on this. <laughs> but this is the scenario that we could... Uh, have on that so so your self-awareness and say well I and we do get this I don't think this report really is true because I see myself as this or that and the point about it of any psychometric assessment particularly in this behavior based is that we're comparing you to thousands of other people who right. have taken this assessment and actually when you get a proper distribution of the population you then start to find out really where you are as opposed to where you have assumed you where are you want to be where you want to be that's yeah. right interesting so you can use this for self-development as well yes really useful for that and that comes back to um uh, the one of the key uh, mission statements for arctic shores around this was we we didn't just want to help companies make better decisions but we wanted to help the individuals who are applying to companies make better career choices and it, it we found it incredible that Thousands and thousands of young people were going through a recruitment process and getting little to no feedback on their personal strengths and whether the organisation they had applied to was really best suited to them. Yeah. Unfortunately, little or no feedback is a trend that carries on through your career. <laughs> it does. It does. How have you, because um, you, you mentioned kind of AI or algorithms or have you, you you might define it how how have you implemented that into into the technology so it's a big debate in the uh, psychometric world at the moment because the uh, the marketing spin that has come out of the US is you know AI yeah. is good machine learning is clever 
uh, and we've started to see more cases coming out saying that well AI is certainly clever and can make improvements but it can also take a step backwards as, as Amazon found when you know if you're training an algorithm or a computer program on data that is in itself yeah. flawed or has a, a degree of bias in that data set then you're, all you're going to do is amplify yeah. that. Wasn't there something trained on Twitter that became racist, sexist and homophobic in about It was two Microsoft, minutes? yes. Microsoft, that's yes. it. Yes, yeah. they came out with, a, with an AI a chatbot uh, yeah. that was just going to learn from the way uh, uh, <laughs> that people interacted with it very quickly. Um, yes, it, it learned from some of the darker sides. Well, so of, don't train any AI on any human conversation. <laughs> <laughs> well, it just shows but, you that that's right. That the, the any 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 algorithm is is based on the information that's given to it. Yeah. And so there's um, much more discussion now around the ethical use of AI. Okay. And as a philosophy graduate, I, I'm thrilled to see that my philosophy now, my philosophy degree, has, has some relevance to the world that I'm in. <laughs> so I understand the, you know, the concept of, of ethics and how you approach things that will have an impact, uh, particularly on, on you know, human activities like, like recruitment in the workplace. Yeah. So the... The use now of AI has as much better European Union is putting out guidelines around that. The challenge, I think, for the world of HR, and particularly of recruitment, is that you've just been getting your mind around this explosion of technology and HR tech yeah. and, and how you know what an API is and how do you pull various different technologies together to make recruitment better. And now suddenly you have to become an AI statistical expert so that when companies are saying, oh, we've got a, an algorithm now that is going to help you find the best candidates, how do you interrogate whether that statement is true or yeah. not? Yeah. And, or even whether elements of that statement are true and other elements need further probing and understanding. You, we just don't, haven't asked HR to ever have that, that training or that understanding before now. Interesting. And is it AI or is it algorithms? So this, that's a really important distinction and, and great question because the, um, uh, most, most companies that claim to use artificial intelligence really just have an algorithm, which, which is just a formula. Right, okay. So um, the, the real definition of artificial intelligence is, 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 is whether that computer program can uh, respond back and take the information it's given and alter then its interaction with whatever the okay, uh, inputs right. it, it's being given. Yeah. Uh, as opposed to, here's just some information, and I'm just going to process that more efficiently and faster for you. And the, unfortunately, the marketing spin around artificial AI, intelligence AI, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, is, is that efficiency piece when, in fact, the true definition, you know, if you start looking at what IBM were doing, was doing with its Deep Blue program and then Google um, DeepMind was, was, was doing around um, uh, Asian game Go and, and trying to see then how wit humans is that I get an input yeah. and, and now I have to process that but I have to judge what the other uh, or the next input might be from an external source. Now you've got proper intelligence yes. being applied over and above just the data activity that's going on. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think with the Google Mind, correct me if I'm wrong, didn't they find that um, uh, DeepMind with a human performed better yes. than just just with with uh, with DeepMind? Yes, absolutely. And you, uh, I listened to a very good talk by Gary Kasparov, who was, who was the chess player uh, that sat against uh, IBM's uh, big blue computer, oh. and and he said now in the in the typical uh, chess. Um, electronic chess game or, 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 or program that you can get on the internet you just give an average chess player um, the support from you know a computer chess game and and they will perform at a grand master level so wow. you're wow. you're absolutely right that the, um, the 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 benefit really and that was his point around this is that we shouldn't necessarily look at artificial intelligence as a threat rather it's a capability and how do we embrace it in the right way rather than just either blindly follow it yeah, or, yeah. or be fearful of it so with hr then just kind of circling back to recruitment there's so many things out there 
I mean, a lot, you know, like so many, um, so much HR tech, I guess is the buzzword. What, what, what could they do to, to filter through it or learn about it to then implement into their recruitment process? Yes, and it is scary. I mean, I, I think uh, for the average HR manager or the CHRO, they're being bombarded by uh, new ideas, new companies. I mean, I, I saw some stat uh, that showed that I think investment into the HR tech space by venture capital and private equity in the last three years has trumped any other area of uh, investment um, in, in workplace software. Uh, but because it's just been seen as last area to be really automated. I mean, there's been a lot that's gone into cybersecurity. Yes, so for yes. HR now, they're being bombarded with all these different solutions. And, and I think that probably a couple of things are the best way to address that. One is to uh, talk to, to other people and other uh, you know, uh, peers within the HR community of how they've, how they've done that. And others is that there, there are really good um, uh, bloggers and podcasters uh, who, who give insights on steps and tips on the yes, way to, to address it. And I, I do think it's very important to, to go out and learn and research around uh, this um, before, before then having to make a decision. But the, 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 ultimately, I think the, the, the call around this will be what's your backbone that you want to to have uh, underlying your recruitment and maybe L and D, yeah, and then and then look at a it's a slightly overused term, but I think the concept is right of an ecosystem of well, what's best to breed that we lock into or connect into that backbone, yeah, uh, which will make it much easier then to to then think about right, how do I build up a, an overall picture? But it has to be seen. You you need to have an HR tech strategy. In yeah. the same way that you'll have a workforce planning strategy, and I don't think HR have ever thought about no. the technology piece in that way. No, but also leadership and management probably haven't either. Yes, but also, yes. I mean, but but to that point, what you're seeing now is that HR is being rebranded to people. So you're yes. having like CH uh, rather than CHROs, directors of people, yes. people directors. You know, and the conversations around putting people at the heart of the organisations, because <laughs> ultimately a company is just made up of people. Yes. And, and it seems like it's, you know, it's moving that way. Yes. And hopefully over time there'll be more budget for this stuff, although it sounds like the cost is going down anyway. Yes. Because um, you can, you know, these things, I guess, the, the price is going down and, and all of those things. But it's getting your head around it. It's just kind of maybe this growth mindset, I guess, of, you know, the, the classic HR person of 10 years ago looks very different now and will yes. look again different in, yes. in 10 years. It will. And I, I, I think you're, you're quite right. Where HR came from was more an administrative. Personnel. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. You know, it was a sort of legal protection, payroll yeah. kind of thing. Whereas now it's much more strategic, which is right. Yes, yeah. Um, and an interesting, this change from CHRO to CPO. Yeah. And, and, then, and then I think the other big trend we're seeing around that is um, people analytics then. Yes. And yeah. this concept now of the data should just uh, the uh, people uh, department office, however you want to describe it, yeah. shouldn't just be a uh, an area that's looking at uh, development around that, but actually a source of really good data on the performance of the business and that can be used to help in the planning of the business. As definitely, well. definitely. As you see more go on the board and on the leadership teams, and I, and I'm seeing that quite a lot now. You have the people director or CHRO, mm. uh, at least on the leadership team, if not on the board. Yes. And then, you know, then you can then they start to be listened to more, and it come, becomes like more of the heart, which is really interesting. It is, and very exciting, I think, yeah, because yeah. it's you know, it so it's for too long companies were saying, oh, people are the you know, the greatest asset that we've got. And and yet it's been lip service really because it's not been the department that's had the greatest investment. No, and quite and payroll. quite a tough job to do as well. I mean, mm. people director, you're having to reorg, but you know if you're it, but I mean all sorts of things. But very very interesting if you if you get it right. I think. How can you measure success with these things now? And great, another great question, and really important for for any kind of investment in HR tech, which is you know what's the return on investment, what's yeah. the value this is going to to give us, and 
there are often too many uh, big projects that go in where there isn't enough thought up front of saying, well, what is going to be our measurement? So it might be uh, time to hire, it might be cost to hire. I mean, I, yeah. I have, I've often challenged quite a few, particularly in the early career graduate recruitment space, is what is your cost per hire? And in many cases, they will either give an estimate or they'll say, well, I spend this much uh, on marketing. And I'm going, yes, but if you actually went to your marketing department and said to them, what's the cost of acquisition for a client? That is a metric yeah. that they are measured on on a weekly, let alone monthly yeah. basis of, are we spending our advertising budget in the most effective way? And it seems strange that we haven't applied some of those metrics Absolutely, yeah. um, on, on the, the, uh, you know, the, the HR or people uh, department. I don't know why. Um, it's only with graduate recruitment it's probably easier I mean certain jobs take longer to hire than others but I mean it's it's easy to measure it is it is and there should just be you some guidelines data, and standards cost, on you the, have the data the time and, and and some of it is um, just uh, it could just be a data capture on this so yeah um, you know we've we, we still come across uh, organizations particularly in North America where they their initial they get thousands of people that apply and they actually have teams of people reviewing resumes CVs uh, before then deciding who will come in so you've actually got a person and they don't when they look at the cost behind they say oh well you know we spend this much on advertising and this much on the cost of organizing event but, yeah, but what about all these people that have sat there just staring at bits of paper, yeah. um, which actually inherently... Could be a little bit biased as well, maybe. Absolutely. I mean, get a little AI in there, an yep. algorithm, yep. pick out the keywords and... Oh, I just, I mean, I just, you, 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 you're you exactly right. Whether, whether that is even a, you want a minimum qualification on there. Yeah, you could just specify. Um, because you have lots of people that, that of, of just looking at, uh, you know, keywords in there. And of course, but again, you're into that challenge of... Yeah educational bias yeah, and yeah. you know and social socioeconomic status bias the thing i the thing i find and that, that we measure um which i think is really the hidden cost in recruitment is candidate retention yes because you, you can spend money up front for sure advertising recruitment agencies time but the real hidden cost is retention right because you if you if you make a bad hire you've spent all of this time training um emotional energy hiring yes and and then obviously when someone leaves or you have to uh, make some redundant or whatever it might be again that emotional thing of having to do that rehire so i think i'd like to see more people measure on candidate retention yes and i think that can definitely be improved with these types of techniques and a really important metric i mean you, yeah. you look at some parts of organizations so there's increasing now you have contact centers that will yeah. And, and many of them are now being insured rather than offshored. And the standard in that industry is between 35 and 40 percent attrition a year. Really? Yes. Wow. And but they accept it as a right. this is the industry norm. And if they do a little bit better, they're doing a bit better. But with no other role in an organisation would we accept that level of attrition. And when you look at it, why, why, why do we have that? It is because the recruitment process around this is very much, um, well, can somebody read instructions and, and respond then to a caller um, yeah. and, then, and then what they've been told and they just follow a, a script yeah. on, a, on a computer screen rather than is this person suited to being in a room where there are lots of other people on headsets, it's quite intense, and going through this repetitive um, work scenario day in, day out. And there are some people that are suited to that and are happy yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, to do that. And it suits, but they're not recruiting on that basis. It's just, uh, and you see so many people just go, oh, well, I'll just go to a contact center for six months, I'll earn some money, and then I'll go traveling afterwards. Yeah. And, and and then these companies are just going through this huge cost people, and yeah. energy um, and training people and just accepting that they're um, going to lose them after six months. You think, well, it's what, crazy. A, what a, an inefficient uh, business activity. It's a tough one. They're probably, just, they're probably just resigned to the fact that it's just a job that someone might do for six months during uni or after yeah. uni. or 
and not just not thinking about it as well. Let's find the people where this is suited to, yeah. who, or you know, the type of the personality traits that they're quite yeah. happy to come in day in day out. Some progression, maybe you could get up. I mean, yeah, yeah. So many things if you looked at it. So I think you're yeah. you're right. People do look at a. I do see on a, a retention stat that quite often uh, companies will have, but it's not done uh, per per department, or it's not put in as a as a cost of well yeah. you know if, if we improved it in this department how how much would that improve yeah, things? Yeah. What I'd really love to see is firms giving candidates the space to find out about them. Yes. Because all so much of it's one sided. Um, the questioning, the psychometrics, all of these things, right, which is great. But ultimately, as an individual, you want to join a great group of people. Mm. Shouldn't really matter what the brand name is per se, right? Yes. Because you can learn a lot, so much from a great manager. You'd enjoy, you're, you're really happy in a nice team. Yes. Giving just giving people the space, or even some was it more information. It would be great to receive the psychometrics of the guy or girl you might be working for. Yes. You know, just a, a little bit of like kind of give and take. You know, open, honest, transparent. That kind of stuff. I'd love to see that. It would. I'm with you on that one. And and interestingly, we, one of my team, who's who's head of uh, our our global accounts, has has added this little step into our own recruitment process, where where we're down to the last couple of candidates, and then we actually will invite them to come and join a, a team uh, social uh, after work, just so that they can get to talk to a few people, a few few of the general team. Yeah. And, and the feedback we've got from that has been really positive and just they said wow it was the first time where before I was got to that sort of actual job offer stage yeah um, I felt I could get to know and they felt much more positively about the recruitment it's just process more human. it is do you know what I might do I'm gonna I'm gonna share my Arctic Shores psychometrics with whoever yeah. comes to join us next and uh, I think it's so powerful yeah it's like this is me yeah this is what I'm like Yes. This is what I'm like under stress. This is what I'm like in all these kind of things. Yes, um, it's a good, powerful way to. It is. To lead. It is, and I, I. It comes back to that the general point uh, that you've been making around this, which is how do we in this world of automation, how do we still keep the human touch element yeah. uh, at the forefront of 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 how this should be conducted? Because it's very easy. Yeah. To, to get so entranced by the automation and the efficiencies that we forget at the end of the day this is not a candidate number, this is a real person yeah, yeah. who's got real needs and wants and personality that, that we should be respectful. Definitely, of. definitely. What a beautiful place to end. Oh, brilliant. Thank you so much for coming in, I really appreciate it. Likewise, Lewis. And I look forward to using it. Brilliant, it's been great. Thank to, you very uh, much. Chance. Thank you. Hey folks, thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe in all the usual places. Bye.